is um, enrollment for the fall and the spring semester. There's a large focus at the college and university of quote landing the class. Uh, and so we have, and you know, because that's our largest source of, of, uh, of funding, which is tuition. Uh, there are different strategies for incoming freshmen, for transfer students, returning students, international and uh, domestic graduate students. And all of these groups are critical to our success and they all have different strategies. Uh, and we're, we're pursuing all of them to make sure that we can, uh, we can get them here in the fall. Now, UC is confident that enrollments won't take a major hit, but the best estimates we have now is that we'll be about $24 million short in tuition compared to pre-COVID-19 predictions. So coupled with the reduction of state funding and prorated reimbursements for housing, student life fees, et cetera, the university needs to plan for about a $75 million budget cut uh, or approximately 20% of our general funds. For the college, 20% uh, translates to approximately $6.9 million. So President Pinto has made it clear that we're not going to do across the board cuts through this crisis, that we need to do strategic sizing. Uh, and, and those strategic sizing discussions we've had over the past 12 months is the perfect foundation for the next 12 months. Uh, we'll need to accelerate those timelines, but those plans uh, that we made have positioned us well for the next decade, and we're going to be able to, uh, to use that as a wonderful roadmap. So we have a lot of unknowns, but that roadmap will be a great access to uh, asset to navigating through these troubling times. You know, unfortunately, there'll be many universities that won't survive over the next two years. There are plenty of univer public universities in Ohio and throughout the region that are having far worse conversations than we are. Um, what we need to do over the next 12, 24 months will be very challenging, but we remain dedicated to the quality education we deliver our students. I have no doubt that we'll come out of this much stronger college and a much stronger university. And what gives me uh, confidence is one, our enrollments have continued to increase year after year, or other universities have struggled to attract students. Um, also, Despite demographic headwinds nationally and particularly in the Midwest, the engineering profession has large untapped talent. Uh, so, for example, last fall we had a record uh, female enrollment, freshman uh, female enrollment of 23%, uh, but that's unacceptable. Uh, and then gender parity alone would enable us to achieve our enrollment goals. So, once again, there's a there's a large pool of untapped talent. In addition. Uh, we're not fulfilling our public mission of serving underrepresented minorities. And as an urban university, we must work uh, closely with Cincinnati Public Schools and other uh, community institutions to increase our impact among uh, those that have less opportunities. We also have a vibrant co-op program that makes us distinct and it also means that we're tied more closely to industries than, than most universities. We have an innovation district that's going to be critical in rebuilding our economy. We have research programs tied to the health sciences, computing, infrastructure, and the industries of the future that allow us to take advantage of needed, needed uh, government investments. So there's every reason to be bullish on the College of Engineering and Applied Science. And so I'm excited, even though, the, again, the next year or two is gonna be challenging, I'm very excited for the future. Um, speaking of the short term though, let me provide some brief comments on returning in the fall. Uh, so in the simplest terms, there are three modes of instruction uh, that you can think of, you know, fully immersive, what you all went through, what, you know, what we've done in the past, uh, synchronous, online synchronous, so in other words, live remote instruction, um, and online asynchronous or recorded lectures. Uh, and I get repeatedly asked, which of these are we gonna be doing in the fall? And my answer is all three. Uh, in the past, these were probably distinct modes of instruction, but in the fall, it'll be a blend of all of these. And, and quite frankly, we'll be no different than our other peer institutions, regardless of what their public statements are. We're all gonna be in this blended mode that's uh, gonna have to be quite nimble uh, as we maneuver through these unknowns. So if I had to put in the simplest uh, terms what our goal is for the fall uh, regarding instruction, it is to minimize the density on campus while providing an engaging experience for our students. Exactly what it's gonna look like is constantly changing. And I know 
everyone would like a more definitive answer. I'd like a more definitive answer. Uh, but regardless of that, what we will do is develop an engaging educational experience by offering numerous courses with face to face components, but also provide quality online uh, aspects to all of these courses. We'll, we will consider those face to face uh, parts of our instruction precious so that when they're on campus, uh, we make the most of it at, with that minimal encounters, but as meaningful as possible. Uh, labs, for example, um, is, is one that you want to do face to face, but we can provide quality videos and pre lab assignments so the students can minimize the time they spend in the lab. While still gaining the important hands on experience they need. Um, we have both university and college wide task force represented by each program to gather best practices uh, and help us improve the technology on our end and disseminate that to, to all the professors. We also have a network of colleagues you know, at other universities sharing ideas. We are, as you can imagine, we are not the only ones going through this. Uh, and remember, we had 10 days to move to remote instructions in March. We now have over 10 weeks. We can't control the virus, but we can control how we respond. And I know we will respond well to the challenges ahead. A key part of our response is going to be communication. At the end of the day, communication can greatly reduce the stress and reassure students that we care about them learning. Uh, and that part of the educational process has not changed. Uh, let me conclude with uh, some wonderful, um, wonderful response we received from uh, faculty, staff, and alumni about helping our fellow Bearcats. So, on Giving Tuesday at the beginning of May, UC raised more than $325,000 from over 1,500 gifts. Our goal was 500 gifts because we weren't sure exactly um, how everyone would be able to respond after we had done some previous urgent campaigns in March and April. Um, so to, to triple our goal in gifts was, was outstanding. Uh, the college raised approximately $40,000 from 150 gifts. So that was about a 10% increase over last year. Uh, for Giving Tuesday, the UC Emergency uh, Student Fund was one of the most popular choices for donors uh, they, for, uh, with about 86 gifts, additional gifts from, uh, uh, from previously. So if you combine that with the emergency uh, relief uh, campaign, uh, we raised over $215,000 uh, from about 900 gifts. Student Affairs is administering the funds and as, as of last week, they received 830 applications for support and were able to help uh, um, 230 students by dispensing about $100,000 so far. So that's wonderful. And, and most of these uh, applications were request from students who were requesting things like, you know, to pay rent, utility bills, food. I mean, basic, basic needs uh, that, uh, that they're struggling with. So again, thank you for your support, and I look forward to working with you uh, throughout the year and, and, uh, and answering any other questions you have tonight. Uh, but now let me uh, turn things over to Logan Lindsay. Uh, we wanted to give everyone the chance to hear from one of our students about their experiences during this pandemic. Logan is uniquely qualified to also give insight to the larger uh, CEAS and UC student experiences as he ends his term as uh, uh, as college tribunal president and um, and and going into uh, president elect of the UC's student body. So we're quite proud of Logan. So Logan, um, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, uh, Dean Weiner for the introduction and to Ann Terry for allowing me to be a part of this town hall. I would also like to take a second to acknowledge all of you, the alumni that are on the call today, your dedication and contributions to this university have not gone unnoticed. And I hope that when I become an alumnus, I'm able to make the same impacts that you are all leaving today. Now to provide some information on the current climate over the past few months, students have been a very appreciative of the quick and decisive actions taken by the university, staff, faculty, and administration. This includes moving coursework remote, the pro rata refunds of various expenses and pass fail options for students. Furthermore, as many of you are probably aware, there was an announcement um, at the end of spring that all in-person co-ops for the summer term would not be permitted for mandatory programs in colleges, one of those including ours. 
That announcement sparked much frustration and confusion for the affected students, and I was very happy to see that it was overturned just a few short weeks later. So that way students can continue to work for amazing alumni such as yourself. And personally, to share some of the changes that I've had to gone through, uh, I was on co-op at Siemens PLM software this past spring and transitioned to remote work around mid-March. I am very fortunate being a computer engineering student um, that it was very easy to transition to remote work compared to uh, say a construction management student who probably couldn't work on a construction site remotely. And although I am from London, Ohio, I decided to stay in Clifton throughout all of this. I do very much enjoy seeing my family, but I know how unproductive I can be when I head home. So I knew it would be best just to, to stick in Cincinnati. I've been very fortunate to be able to work with various campus partners to ensure that students have everything needed during this remote period. This includes resources from the Bearcat Pantry, transportation, uh, counseling and psychological services, university health services, and housing accommodations. And also, um, Dean, uh, Dean Weiner touched on this a little bit, through a collaboration with Student Affairs and the UC Foundation, I was able to assist with the Student Emergency Fund that has received commitments and pledges for over $200,000 to assist students in need. And then lastly, although the spring semester ended in a way that was not expected, students are very optimistic for a new beginning, optimistic to return to campus in the fall, and optimistic for another year with their second home. They carry with them a new sense of appreciation for the little things in their college careers, things like seeing their friends on campus, having in-person organization meetings, being in a crowded bar or party. Students experienced many last this past spring without even realizing it, and as a result, are very excited to return to campus this fall and find more reasons to be thy loyal Bearcats, very much like you all. I also want to add, since writing these remarks, there have been many updates regarding how the student body has reacted to the recent racial, uh, excuse me, racial injustices that we've witnessed across the country. I'm honored to share that the community has come together in a way that I have not seen before to stand in solidarity with our black students in the fight against racism. Yesterday, there was a protest hosted right off campus by the United Black Student Association, and I am proud to share that over 300 students attended this event to protest for a better future and for a better Cincinnati community. Thank you, Dean Widener and Anne. This concludes my remarks. Thanks, Logan. Thank you so much, Logan, and thank you, Dean Widener. And I'm so proud to work for the College of Engineering and Applied Science, and it's exciting under Dean Widener's leadership to see where we're gonna head next. Um, so for the Q&A, um, I'm gonna start with a few questions that people sent in in advance, and then we'll move to those which have been coming through on the chat. So please continue adding them to the chat and I'll make sure that they get asked. Um, one of the questions that we had was about how the co-op programs are impacted by the pandemic. Um, and in addition, more about how our recruiting efforts have gone this year. And I know that um, Dean Widener, you touched a little bit up and so did Logan about the co-op programs, but if you, um, both of you could expand on that, both from the, your perspective, Dean Widener and Logan, um, and then maybe talk a little bit about how our recruiting efforts have gone. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll start with uh, follow up with Logan said about co op. So, uh, there, uh, there, there was definitely confusion and, and not the best communication along those lines early on. Some of that had to do with uh, the fact that we had a, when we had originally had to make our statement. Um, uh, the, uh, the governor had not opened up the state yet. And so we were reluctant to, to allow co ops to go out. Fortunately, that announcement came soon after and we were able to. Um, uh, to allow co-ops uh, for the for the summer, even with that, there were a number of students. Uh, you know, so fortunately, some students were able to to get co-ops and, uh, and and get on uh, and get face to face um, on site co-ops. Others were able to do remote uh, co-ops, and so that was nice. Certainly not at the level that we ha have in the past. So the co-op office uh, worked diligently to provide additional opportunities for uh, for students to get. Uh, professional training that was going to count towards their co-op. So that was very successful, the feedback I've seen, and maybe Logan has uh, uh, more to add on that. For the fall, we're optimistic uh, that that co-op will, will return more to normal, as, you know, again, as, uh, as, as long as the state can return, return to normal. We know a lot of industries have taken hits, um, uh, both for their permanent uh, employees and, uh, and hence for, for co-ops. 
so we're confident in it, but we're not, you know, we're that, that's an unknown and, and one that we hope uh, 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 we, we hope will continue to, to look good. If not, we're prepared once again to to, to offer more um, of these professional development opportunities. We are not allowing students to to switch semesters. So to take, you know, two academic years in a row that would uh, that would mess up uh, lots of things. So we've we've made sure we've uh, gotten with advisors to to keep them on track and to, and to make sure they get their their co-op credits. Regarding enrollments, um, we had a pretty aggressive enrollment uh, for the fall pre-COVID. Um, our numbers are. Uh, numbers are actually up for the fall as far as um, commitments there we, we expect a maybe a larger fraction of melt than we've had in the past of students that decide not to go to um, uh, to college in the fall but again the numbers look very good and we are preparing and doing everything we can and also sending the message that even though college won't be you know like um, as I said in my statement it won't be uh, like all of you were used to and all and, and we were used to in the fall last fall, uh, we're committed to an engaging experience, an experience that's worth having students on campus uh, and participating in uh, in college life. Logan, you can add to that. Yeah, I, I think you did a really good job hitting the the question about co-op and what's that what that's going to look like. Um, a lot of the the confusion that really sparked was a result that. Uh, mandatory colleges like CES, DAP, um, mandatory co-op colleges, they were not permitted to co-op over the summer in person, whereas colleges like Lindner, where it's optional, um, they, they were allowed to co-op in person just for liability concerns. So there was a lot of confusion there about uh, how students can react. But um, just the, the announcement of being remote co-ops only um, definitely caused students to feel a lot more concerned financially. Um, as many of you probably did this during your time as a student, using the, the co-op uh, income to pay for some, uh, the next semester of tuition payments. So students who are co-oping over the summer that might have lost their employment status as a result of um, COVID, they're, they're very concerned for how they're going to be funding things uh, in the fall financially. So that's something that um, I know has been brought up to Dean Weiner as well as many other deans is just trying to, to think of ways to ensure students can re be retained and stay on here in the fall. Um, and in terms of uh, the, the question about recruitment, um, I have not been seeing the, the recent numbers since the uh, deadline for committing closed on June 1st, but I, I am proud to share that right before that, the the numbers of um, compared to last year, it was very minimal. I'd say it was around 3% difference compared to what we had last year. Um, and many students like to commit on that last day. So again, very, very optimistic. Housing has received, I want to say around 8,000 applications. So they, they uh, students want to be here in the fall. The the first year students would like to, to live on campus. So it'll again, just come down to melt and how that looks over the summer. Yeah, like I said, Logan, we're up a few hundred, up 250 students from last year from a commitment standpoint, yep. Okay, so um, one of our next questions was about how COVID-19 is impacting the um, CQU relationship and what are the plans for this program moving forward? And um, if the program has been impacted at all in addition by our government's relationship with China. Yeah, we could spend a while on this one. Um, it, it has definitely been uh, impacted. It was actually impacted first. Um, so, as you know, China had the outbreak originally in, in February. And so we had a, a rush to bring our uh, four TAs that were over there doing their, their co-op. I had to bring them back. Uh, the instructors were, were back from holidays, any, from the Chinese holiday. So they stayed. And so we had to do spring online um, starting in February. So pretty much the way our UC students were doing it, but uh, with an extra month of online. Um, uh, CQU was very hopeful that we could send faculty there in the summer. Um, uh, we have an international travel restriction, so we could not send anyone there yet. The hope was that we might be able to um, send them there for the second half of the summer. That's um, 
that's looking less and less likely. Uh, there, it's still a, there's still a window of opportunity there, but more than likely, it, uh, the entire summer will remain remote for CQU, even though their, uh, their campus is open. And in the fall, um, uh, there's a few things working against us. Again, one is one is the uh, uh, the travel ban, uh, the uh, uh, just the COVID-19 and being able to go over there and having to quarantine. And then the other is the travel ban. So right now we we couldn't send people over anyway. And then the third is um, most of the embassies are closed and we can't get uh, get visas. So it's possible. Um, but we're still hopeful that we'll have uh, uh, we'll be able to send some faculty over um, in the fall and do some uh, carry out some of the the face to face instruction. But uh, uh, just like for UC, we're prepared for uh, a variety of modes on that. Uh, but it, that one will be the, the by far the most challenging. And actually, all of our international students, graduate students coming here, will be the most challenging because of. Uh, uh, travel issues, flights, visas, and so on, and, and going over to uh, CQU will also be challenging. Thank uh, you. John, this is Alan. Oh, 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 this is Alan. Also, we have the seniors that are from CQU that are supposed to come here in fall. They, they won't be coming because they can't get visas either. So they, we're hoping they come in January and we're going to offer their classes via distance learning to them in China in fall. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Thank you, Alan. And for those that don't know, that's Alan Arthur, one of our associate deans. So thank you for chiming in. Um, we also had a question um, via the chat about whether or not UC is going to be suspending the testing requirements for the SAT and ACT. And I got um, some messages from our um, recruitment office. And for those of you that may not have seen the UC News article, but they will be waiving it for the next two years. Um, so there, if you're curious to read more, UC does have an article on its news site giving more detail about that, but that will be waived for the next two years. Um, another question that we received um, in advance um, was from a former PNG employee who worked for PNG for many years and wanted an update on the relationship between PNG and the College of Engineering. Um, yeah, and I don't know if if you have a slide to pull up, but I can. Uh, we uh, yeah. So when we saw this, um, we we do have this this timeline that was. Put together, um, and we have a you know a tremendous relationship as this slide shows, going back to 1898, um, where uh, P and G and UC have worked together. Um, most recently, um, the, the UC Simulation Center was started in 2008, and that has continued uh, uh, for the last 12 years. And it is an incredible um, way of training. Our graduate students, uh, co-ops, undergraduates, um, uh, you know, two million dollars annually in supporting that. So that's been absolutely wonderful. And then this past year, we've had discussions with launching a skin science technology collaborative. Uh, so we're still working out uh, details of that. And of course, we have numerous um, PNG alumni, uh, uh, or UC alumni that work at PNG. So yeah, that that relationship has been extremely strong over the years, and it's um, uh, it hasn't gotten any uh, any weaker. So I do thank uh, I thank our partners for that. Um, another question we received um, in the chat was about now that there are more online courses, will there be additional opportunities for alumni and employers to guest lecture remotely? Yeah, I think I think there's there'll be a, opportunities in multiple directions. One, I think we're going to be able to offer more courses to our industrial partners without having them uh, come to uh, campus, and <clears throat> um, opportunities for our alumni to to help us out. Uh, they also wouldn't have to come to class to uh, or come to campus to deliver a course. So, if anyone is interested, why don't you follow up with me offline uh, uh, on how we can. Uh, we, we can do that. So, yeah, it doesn't matter where you are in the country. Um, we can use you either as a guest lecturer or uh, a, a series of lectures or 
uh, we're, we're open to, to lots of things. So yeah, please, please reach back. That would be wonderful. John, this is Alan again. The, um, for our, our professional development course, second year and the fourth year, they're looking for um, just a guest from industry kind of things to prepare students for co-op and for and co-op experiences and um, getting a job. And so I'm sure they'd be very open to, to be an involved, some involvement. Yeah, and many of you, you know, probably know already how to deliver those things uh, and send them to us. But if you don't, if you need help with the technology, uh, reach out to us as well on that. Uh, but yeah, we would love to have your expertise. And in concert with that, we also received the question um, about if you believe that the curriculum going forward will permanently include a mix of virtual and in person classes. Um, I would say yes and no. I don't. I, I don't think um, what we'll do in the fall is ideal. You know, I think uh, there, especially in engineering, um, in the computing fields and the applied sciences, the hands-on work and the more of that, the more problem solving that you can do, um, uh, the better. However, I do think this gives us some opportunities to supplement courses in a very positive way. Um, uh, you know, the literature has shown that flip classes, for example, where you lecture uh, before the, the students come to, to class and they, they view your lecture so that when they do come to class, they can work on problems um, and, and they can struggle through that, that problem uh, while you're there rather than traditionally you lecture and then they go back to their dorm, they work on problems, struggle, and they have no one there to help. The flip class is shown to be quite effective in Again, lecturing uh, as the homework and then in class working the problems. We've been slow to adapt that just because, uh, you know, people are, it's, it's hard to, to change habits. Um, well, we all had a change in, in again, in, five, in 10 days and we're changing over the summer and into the fall. So I do think we'll be able to leverage some of that great stuff, we're, great content we're developing, and that'll only make our courses better. Um, and so I think we'll, you know, again, a fully engaged on campus student, uh, like in the past is what we, what we want to get back to. And we'll be able to even have a better uh, instruction by supplementing what, what we're developing now. Great. Um, another question we received is disruptive events like COVID-19 can be a great spark for innovation. What changes made in response to COVID-19 do you think will stay after the pandemic and higher ed? Yeah, I mean, I think that's basically what uh, what I had just answered there. Again, I don't think there's a replacement for uh, a residential college, a residential university with all the outside the classroom activities and even the face-to-face -face classroom work, but we have not in the, uh, taken advantage of technology as much as we could have and should have um, and this is this has prompted us and forced us to do that uh, so i think that part will be uh for the better and quite frankly i would you know even though i can't wait to get into a meeting with um, my fellow colleagues uh face to face around a, around a table um some of these meetings are, are much more efficient uh doing it remotely and so i do think we'll have a combination of remote and in-person meetings uh we can do more we can maybe connect better with alumni uh, now that we're doing uh, things like this um, and we don't have to wait for uh, to fly to the West Coast to have that engagement, even though we'll still do that um, and so on. So, yeah, we're we're learning what works and what what doesn't work. We're learning that there there are uh, faculty and staff that can do some of their work effectively at home. And so we may be able to better utilize um, our our resources. Um, on campus and uh, in our office space and so on. So our efficiency should improve. And I think all of you are probably experiencing that same level of uh, potential efficiency gains. Um, also similar to that, uh, someone just asked about, while um, the classroom experience is set to minimize health concerns, what are the plans regarding on-campus housing? And I'm not sure if Logan, you have any insight into that in your role as um, student body president of Dean Widener? You've heard anything um, from leadership as to how they're going to address that? 
I'll let Logan start. Um, I've heard some, but not a lot, but I can fill in if I think of anything or Alan might have some information as well. Yeah, so I, I currently sit on um, two different committees for returning to campus repopulating fall. Um, and one of those is, um, and in one of those meetings, we are hearing presentations from different divisions of the university on how they plan to adapt. Um, for example, we just heard back last week from planning, design, and construction. Uh, we have not heard the presentation yet for university housing. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of applications for housing. So right now, they're experimenting with what would be best having one person per room. Well, if you do that, you're going to be one losing a lot of money and two, um, it's, it's not very efficient, just the, the energy and the amount of work that goes into um, maintaining a dorm. But one thing that they are doing is athletes are returning, um, specifically the football players are returning to campus on June 8th, and they are moving back into their house on, or their housing on, I believe it's 101 East Corey. Um, so they're going to be using that as kind of a depiction for how fall can go. How, how will those students react in their respective space for the whole month of June? Uh, were there any outbreaks? Were there any... Um, COVID cases, uh, and then kind of using that to, to maybe make a decision for fall. Um, so that that's what I've heard and what I've seen on my um, and, and the committees that I've been on. Yeah, that's a good point, Logan. We're, we're actually, we have uh, uh, multiple phases as we repopulate um, or return to campus. The athletes is one. Um, this past Monday, June 1st, uh, research returned to campus. And so we do have graduate students and even undergraduates that are uh, uh, that are working in labs, doing co-ops in labs. Uh, faculty are are back on campus. Um, we are minimizing density, so we're scheduling them so they're not all there at once. We're trying to keep at about 25% capacity. Uh, at, uh, July 1st, we're going to return more staff uh, to campus and so on. So we're as we do <clears throat> this in stages, just like the rest of the country. We're learning what works and what doesn't work. Um, testing is not available now. Um, so we're doing more symptomatic monitoring. Um, <clears throat> that could change in the fall. Uh, you know, if, if testing becomes uh, more prevalent, uh, that would uh, change things. So a lot of the, uh, the, the reason that uh, President Pinto is not want to commit to any one course of action, whether it's with dorms or with Courses is there are just so many unknowns. So even universities that are claiming that they know what they're doing in the fall, they they really don't. Um, and they're all again, we're we're at the mercy of mercy of the of the virus. Um, and there are scenarios for housing as well as there are different scenarios for uh, for the classroom. But we we do realize again the value from an educational standpoint of students being in the dorms on campus. Uh, engaging with each other, but the safety of the students is, is paramount. So, John, this is Alan. I just want to add we're trying to situation where we have students that have all distance learning courses, for example, in their schedule, and yet they come to campus and they're in their housing. So they're basically laying in their door all their classes. I mean, you know, that's the kind of thing that we need to work closely with the regular uh, with the scheduling of courses and deciding which courses should be distance and which one should be in person. All right. And we do, we also recognize on the flip side that there are students that either for health reasons or personal reasons uh, don't want to come back to campus that we will accommodate them as well. So there could be classes that uh, even a lab class that we're going to have to do 100% remotely for those students or maybe students that get sick during the semester, they need to be quarantined, but they still need to keep up with their class. So. That's why I said in my uh, in my remarks earlier, all three of those modes are going to be happening simultaneously, and we're going to be balancing those throughout the semester. Another question that we received: um, How are the changes that are happening being applied to the graduate program, especially with regard to types of research that cannot be performed remotely? Right. So as I'm, uh, yeah. So. As I mentioned uh, this past Monday, we we returned researchers to campus. Um, the message that's gone out nationally as well as at the university is, although we're used to doing our research, you know, uh, all week long in our labs, 
really there's not everything that you need to do in the lab. So if you need to be in the lab taking data, we have protocols for doing that. Um, we have scheduling for doing that. Um, and, and you can be in the lab and take your data and do your social distancing. But when you're doing the data analysis, when you're reading the literature, when you're writing a report, um, you can go back developing a mathematical model. You should be doing that back at your apartment uh, and so on. So by doing that, we can rotate people through that if they need to be on campus. And there are plenty of almost all research groups have some component that they need to be in the lab. Uh, we are providing that and so far, you know, after day 4, uh, it's gone very well. And people have been able to get their work done without without it being uh, your typical crowded. Uh, buildings. So, on to the next question, what was the projected placement rate for graduates pre COVID and what is the new projected placement rate? Are you seeing hirings being postponed? Yeah, just anecdotally, uh, we are. I don't have that information on me. I don't know if Alan does. I know from personal experience, my son graduated in May and he doesn't have a job. So <laughs> we we haven't we're we haven't done the survey yet. We usually survey the students in spring and we're giving them a little longer, obviously as long as we can to, to get jobs. So we don't have this spring's data yet. Normally we're above 98% or so. In, they get gets a job in their in their major, but we don't have the data yet for this year. Um, another question from the chat: Given the recent racial disruption in the country, what is CAS doing to ensure students from all backgrounds feel included and have curriculum that encourages an inclusive mindset for students? Yeah, I mean, fortunately. Um, uh, last summer, or maybe last spring, we established uh, a, um, a division of uh, diversity, diversity and inclusion that started developing programs even, you know, prior to this recent crisis, realizing that we needed to do more to reach out to uh, women and underrepresented minorities, uh, particularly in engineering. Uh, to uh, President Pinto has uh, has had a continuous message since he's been here the last few years of recognizing our role as a public urban um, campus that we need to better engage um, uh, all students that that have less opportunities particularly cincinnati public schools and underrepresented minorities and so we've been uh, uh, there's been a lot of effort on that in terms of camps in terms of bridge programs um, you know unfortunately our bridge programs this summer are virtual but they are continuing um, so we've we have I would say in the last year have ramped up that uh, considerably, and we need to have continued discussions on on what we can do more and what we need to do to uh, uh, to make to make sure we have a, a, a truly inclusive college and inclusive campus. Um, and I know we have a lot of work to do on that, and and we're committed to doing that. Our next question, um, it's actually two questions. Two people asked similar questions about the criteria that the university is using to determine the safety to return to campus. So both what epidemiologists are predicting about the resurgence or second wave of COVID-19, and also that the vulnerable group is over 60 years old and under the under 40 group is not at a significant risk unless they have a pre-existing medical condition. So with all of the stuff that's coming out, all the different um, news, what view is kind of accepted and what's being used to inform the policies that are being developed by the university going forward? Yeah, I mean, we have a tremendous, uh, you know, group of health professionals uh, at UC that are, are, are guiding us uh, on that. I think you know, the perception may be that the fact that we're not saying a lot uh, says that we're we're not going to, um, you know, open the campus and, and and be receptive to opening up, and that and that that's not the case. I think you know the president has repeatedly said no one knows what's going to happen over the next uh, two months. So to make a statement now and to have to change it in a, in a month or two doesn't make sense to him. So he's being 
cautious in uh, in when he says it, but he is gathering all the information from uh, from all the professionals on on maximizing the educational experience while minimizing the risk to um, to our students. Recognizing that, yeah, they're they may be the the less vulnerable, but they're not uh, completely vulnerable, and certainly. Uh, uh, faculty and staff uh, can be vulnerable as well. So we need to balance both the students and the uh, faculty and staff. And yeah, I'm I'm completely confident that they are working with the uh, the best the best health professionals and health data possible to uh, to come up with a uh, a good solution for the fall and going forward. I can probably add on to to the question about. Uh, the vulnerable group, vulnerable group over 60 and under 40, not being uh, under a significant risk. Um, if that's that, I would like to add that that view is very much um, being taken into consideration. If it would, if the university was just considering the student safety, they probably would have announced by now that we're going to be returning in the fall. But faculty and staff have been very strong in their opinions that they do not feel safe returning to campus. Um, given their age, given their medical condition. So they are taking those health concerns and, and those opinions into consideration with this decision um, uh, as we return the fall. They, they are very much listening to the faculty and staff on that one. And, and I'll say with that, you know, the, that's also influencing how we do uh, teaching assignments. So if there are uh, faculty for health reasons that um, uh, don't feel comfortable coming back to campus, we can give them a course that does that is an online course that has much less engagement and then uh, the ones that are comfortable coming back uh, we can give them lab courses design courses you know what the ones that do have more of a face to face engagement so it's not we're not just putting it online because the faculty isn't comfortable with it we're we're iterating on that and accommodating all the groups um, as best we can with the best data we have john, john this is a process of surveying all of our uh, faculty too to see if they can um, uh, end their class by by uh, Thanksgiving so that they don't have the students don't go home for Thanksgiving and then come back and and so forth and go both ways so if we can end this in if we can end the classes early if they give their exam beforehand we're trying to figure that out too so the students don't go home go home and then come back yeah, to clarify that, not necessarily end the class early because we aren't we aren't changing the calendar. Some uh, some universities are moving their calendar up for the reason uh, that Alan indicated. With co-op, we're not uh, we don't have that flexibility, so we're uh, that decision at, at the moment has been made to not move the calendar. However, um, if you can have your course such that it will be online after Thanksgiving, with only a week uh, left in in classes. Uh, that will be significant. So if you have projects, you can still work with your group and, and finish that up. You've already done your prototyping. You've already done your um, uh, uh, the, the things that required uh, campus resources, 3D printing and so on. Um, and then maybe the final exams could also be done, uh, be done remote, remotely. So it's not that the semester will end at Thanksgiving, but the on-campus work might be able to end. And we're trying to, yeah, as Alan said, Talking to people to see if that's a if that's feasible in their course. Just for the online courses, obviously. I mean, the uh, in person courses. I mean, right. We had another question come through about how we are engaging with the Cincinnati Collaborative, um, in lieu of the agreement that was drafted several years ago and has led to positive outcomes. Question mark. Uh. I may need some <laughs> help on that one. Alan, do you know? Um, I don't remember, but give me a minute. I know I have something on this. Give me a minute. Go on to the next one. And give me a minute. I'll, 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 I'll find it. Just a second. Thanks, Alan. Um, one other question, speaking of the length of um, the schedule, we did have someone that asked um, and said some people had reflected fondly on their time when the college used quarters and not semesters. And though that a lot of it is not in 
obviously you're the college's control, you know, is, has there been any discussion about moving back to a quarter system or any changes to the schedule given um, how COVID has impacted? Yeah, um, so I'll say I have not heard of any discussion. I'd be surprised if there's a discussion to move back to the quarter system. Um, I have never been in a quarter system uh, in in my three institutions prior to this, so I don't have any experience uh, with the pros and cons um, of a quarter system, but I don't, I'd be a hard, uh, hard time imagining that we would move back. Um, Alan may have a better perspective. He certainly went through uh, both of those, but again, I, I don't think that's in the plans. I've, I have not heard anything like that. No, I, I don't believe there's any plans to do that because it came, it pretty much came from the state. Ohio State switched and the state wanted all of the, all of the Ohio uh, universities to be on the, on the semester system. So I don't think it's going to go back. We also got an inquiry about if there's been a decrease in the number of co-op jobs available going forward. Yeah, but I would say we would touch on this a little bit earlier. I, I would just say there's um, you know, less companies committing at the moment uh, and, and unsure of the fall. Uh, we're hopeful that that will pick up. And again, these things have been changing quickly. Um, uh, but, but certainly it's, you know, the, the job situation overall is, uh, is not good. I see someone's advocating for seven week school section. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we might be doing that this year. Who knows? Anyone have any last questions while we're waiting for Alan to get the. Um... Yeah, the, for whoever asked that question on the collaborative. The youth collaborative or the live well or the stem collaborative i'm getting mixed up with which what the question was about i believe it's regarding the um, collaborative agreement from 2002 uh in light of um there was there was another killing in in regards to the cincinnati community um so i i believe it's along those lines I don't know the answer then. I'm afraid, John, we may need to send that out. Maybe Ann can send it out after we do some research. I don't know the answer to it right now. I guess our lack of knowledge of it to, does speak <laughs> to that, but we will. Well, yeah. I can speak a little to, to that. Uh, I think the recent events that have taken place this past week have really opened up the eyes on, of many. It's unfortunate that it took this long for that to happen. Um, but as a result of what has been happening, I personally have been communicating more with the black student presidents on campus and creating a list of uh, a list of demands that we want to see from our local UC police division. Um, some of those things include the ban of chokeholds, um, banning the use of military grade weapons. Um, and there's there's eight more I actually just got finished, but I've been working with the Ohio Student Government Association, which is an organization that represents all Ohio universities on these 10 demands. Um, and we will be taking those demands to Director Jim Whalen, who is the director of public safety and also the chief of police uh, and how we want to see these changes being made. So it has been very shifted very quickly in light of recent events that uh, this this is a priority for students and at the forefront of their minds. So I, I will be working with. The, the respective campus partners over the course of my term, which is between now and March, and ensuring we can ensure a safe space for students on campus. And Logan, you the person that asked the question said you have it right. Your instinct on what they were referring to was correct. So thank you for I, answering I was, that. Yeah, no problem. I was five when that happened, by the way, to make you all feel old. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> um, one of the things that um, we're being asked to expand on is the fact that some, in addition to you talking about, you know, the classroom instruction until Thanksgiving and then not having the students come back after Thanksgiving, that some schools are doing e-learning then the entire spring semester. Is, some, is that something that you see as considering? 
Well, I would say we're considering it. We're considering all those options because we don't know, you know, what may happen. So if if the pandemic spikes again and the university needs to close, uh, we would consider that. That's not our preference. Our, um, our, we do anticipate, as we were saying, that we may, we, we won't change the calendar, but we may move to online between Thanksgiving and the spring semester. That's quite likely. Um, uh, more, more or less, uh, more than likely optional at this point, where instructors may uh, may say that. So some students may come back, but not at the same uh, population level. Um, but going all online in the spring would would mean that there is a uh, you know another significant spike in COVID nineteen before we would do that. So we we are prepared for about every scenario possible. Um, we also got the request that maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the key, recent key hires that um, the college has made and about industry 5.0 and bringing back industrial engineering. Okay, so, you know, um, we had a lot of great searches and, and uh, throughout the year and we made a few hires or offers that were accepted before the hiring freeze um, was instituted. So the hiring freeze went into effect, you know, in uh, keeping losing track would probably, uh, you know, it, it, towards the end of March, early April. Um, so there are a few people being hired that were, we were able to hire before the freeze. There are a number of people that unfortunately we wanted to hire that we aren't gonna be able to hire uh, and that'll and that's one of the ways we're going to be able to meet this 6.9 million dollar uh, deficit. Uh, but we're also there in in the area of computing. Um, we are able to still hire because we do. Um, you may remember that there was a Jobs Ohio announcement. Uh, literally, I think it was a week before uh, we closed. So hope, fortunately, that announcement got in place before. Uh, the state shut down. That is a different pot of money than from the state, and so we still have our our Jobs Ohio money, and and that that was a fifty million dollar um, fifty million dollars over uh, three years that we're getting from Jobs Ohio. Twenty five million of it is to to enhance our workforce in the computing fields. And so that greatly impacts uh, our college. And again, we've been able to hire faculty on that. Uh, so, so they've been able, they're gonna be able to start uh, this year. So that was fortunate. Um, the other 25 million is in the health sciences. Uh, so most of, uh, half of that will go to children's hospital and the other half uh, uh, mainly through the medical school, but our college uh, will benefit because we do a significant amount of uh, medical research, not only in biomedical engineering, but also in electrical engineering and so on. Um, and, and that's mainly on the research side. So the, um, the computing is mainly on the jobs on the, on, on degree side for career development for uh, workforce development. And the medical is mainly on the research side. So we'll benefit from that as well. We're, um, we were able to hire uh, before the freeze, uh, the new department head in biomedical engineering. Um, Tom Talovich from Purdue. So we're really excited to, to get him on board. Um, and uh, again, there'll be resources on the medical side to, uh, to build up that program and to, and to better integrate with um, the medical school. And, uh, and then that, the last part of that question with industrial engineering, we're excited to bring that program back. Um, we're not gonna be hiring directly into that for the fall. So we still need approval for that degree program. And um, we're hoping that we will have approval by the fall 2021. However, that is a degree that a lot of students that enter the university switch into. This is a kind of a national trend. A lot of high school seniors don't know what industrial engineering is, but they switch into it when they find out. Um, so we do anticipate that our current freshmen don't know it yet, but they're going to be industrial engineers. Um, and so we think we'll have a, uh, you know, essentially a, a class, 
which is essentially like a 2020 um, freshman class uh, in that. And, and we do have uh, most of the capability to, to teach, certainly at the early stages of that, um, of that major. And then moving forward, you know, after this year, uh, we, uh, we expect to be able to hire um, faculty in that area. We, um, it was unfortunate that that degree program went away, but one of the advantages of it is that we can now start a bit from scratch and, um, and, and design it the way, um, um, you know, kind of the current trends, mainly being a very, uh, a very much a computing big data um, uh, type of industrial engineering uh, approach. And so, again, the, the hires that we're making in Jobs Ohio on the computing side will also um, benefit uh, that degree program. We're putting a lot of certificate programs in place around computing and cybersecurity, um, uh, AI, uh, and again, that will uh, that will help both the industrial engineering and, quite frankly, all of our majors that will be able to take certificates in that area. Uh, so, uh, the hiring. So, in summary, the, the hiring is not as as robust as we had hoped, but it's not zero either, and we were able to make some good strategic hires that will move us forward. Great, and we um, have a question that I think would be great to end on um, for you to share what your proudest moment as Dean during your first year has been. Um, well, yeah, these, no one told me that, you know, I, I'm gonna be doing all this stuff online uh, when I came, but I would say- uh, Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would say I'm, I'm most, uh, Proud of being able to to bring together the faculty and staff. Um, uh, there, you know, it, we, we've done a lot of great uh, kind of team building as as I've just come on um, on board to get to know everyone, and I um, I think everyone has got to know each other much better. And so bringing the college together uh, and and being more uh, teamwork focused, I think, is going to be a great uh, benefit moving forward. Because we do need to work as a team, we need to break down the silos and cooperate uh, better. And, and of course, that's you know that that that's not just UC, but uh, universities in general have a hard time with that. And and I think I'm I'm proud of making the initial steps in in uh, uh, fostering that culture. So uh, I hope we can continue to have that that teamwork and um, um, and camaraderie that we've developed. Uh, over this past nine, 10 months. Well, thank you everyone for your insightful questions. We also got a joke here at the end um, asking if Rogers called Dean Widener for recommendations to draft Josiah Uh Yes, and uh, I gave him the thumbs up and so we're ready to go. <laughs> We've also had some people ask when we're doing this again, and I think this is a great, I would love, um, and I know the Dean would too, to hear everyone's feedback from this event, ideas you have for other opportunities for engagement, um, and to also consider volunteering. We did have a campaign um, just recently with the students where we had alumni volunteer to review senior resumes and um, give some critiques and also do mock interviews. And we had about 100 students sign up for that, um, which was fantastic. So we have year round opportunities um, from, as I said, resume reviews, career coaching, recruiting future Bearcats, and we would love to have you all um, participate. Um, so thank you everyone for attending. Have a wonderful evening and we appreciate you. Yeah, thank you. It was a wonderful turnout. Um, I don't know what the peak was at, but it was over 60 participants. Um, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you found it worthwhile and I, uh, I'm happy to do these again. This is, this is great, but I also am anxious to see you at a football or basketball game in person. So I look forward to it. Thank you. Thanks everyone.